In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, a man was helping one of his cows give birth when he noticed his five-year-old son standing wide-eyed at the fence, taking in the whole event. And the farmer thought, oh, this is just great. He's only five, and I'm going to have to start explaining all about the birds and the bees. I won't do that just yet, though. He says, I'll let him ask, and I'll answer. And after the birthing was done, the man walked over to his young son and said, Well, son, do you have any questions? Well, just one, Daddy, gasped the still wide-eyed young boy. How fast was that calf going when he hit the cow? <laughs> Thank you for that. Albert Einstein, the great scientific genius of the 20th century, he wrote this. He said, to raise new questions, new possibilities, to regard old problems from a new angle, requires creative imagination and marks real advances in science. Einstein, of course, was more a scientist than a philosopher or a theologian, but there's something in that idea of raising new questions regarding old problems from a new angle that speaks, I think, to the story of the blind man in our Gospel today. I'm hopeful that this story speaks to us today as we seek to make sense of God's activity in our lives and in our world. Because what this story does is it to show Jesus inviting his disciples and others around him to raise new and better questions, and in so doing, it marks a real advance in the theology of his day. However, as always, there were always people who wanted to stay stuck in the old questions. And John's story begins with a question, an old question, posed by the disciples. Right we hear, as he walked along, he saw a blind man from birth, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Now notice how John, the, the evangelist, sets the context here. Notice that Jesus is the one who sees the man born blind. In fact, John says, he saw a man, not they saw a man. The disciples didn't really see the man, they categorized him. So they ask a question intended to assign blame for the fact that the man can't see. Hey Jesus, is it he or his parents that were at fault? It's an age-old question, right? Who sinned? Who's at fault here? And the question gets raised in the wake of public and private tragedy, large-scale disasters, or family or personal crises. If something bad happens, somebody must be to blame, right? You can always find voices who will say that it's because of somebody's sin that this or that happened. From a tsunami to a hurricane to a cancer diagnosis or suicide or from the problem of poverty or homelessness or, as we know, to a pandemic. Who sinned? Who messed up? Who or what made God angry enough to cause or allow something like this to happen? Somebody to be born this way. Somebody to wind up this way. That's what the disciples want to know. And that's what we might want to know. I think it's important in this context, brothers and sisters, for me to mention a little bit about some of the questions that we might be having about this pandemic, particularly questions that might be rooted in a little bit, or a lot, of racism. Right from the early goings until today, there's conspiracy theorists saying that it's the Chinese people that have done this. Or this past week, there was the, the case of the, of the First Nations community that had a sun dance. There's questions about, you know, social distancing, whether or not that didn't happen. But if you read some of the comments on social media about that, some of the age-old questions of racism comes out. You can see it in between the lines, or in fact, even more blatant. I want to blame that group of people, blame this group of people, blame this person. This is who caused this. Let's be clear about that, brothers and sisters, that, you know, in these days, this is a time for new questions. Not the old questions that we seem to always ask. 
And lest, though, we think it's grumpy old men or racists who think this way, you should know that the desire to lay blame runs deep in all of us. We're pretty good at taking blame on ourselves or dishing it out to others. Just think of a time when one of your children misbehaved or made poor choices. What did I do to cause this or what did my wife do to cause this? Who's at fault? Who's responsible? The question is really based in a particular theology, an approach to life, that maintains that if you do good, you get good. If you do bad, you get beat. And sure enough, sometimes life does work that way. Sometimes people who eat right and exercise and are kind and gracious and hardworking and do the right thing most of the time, they live long and happy lives. And sometimes people face severe consequences for decisions they make in life. You smoke a lifetime, you get cancer. You don't exercise and eat right, maybe you'll get diabetes. You play with fire, you might get burned, you cheat and you might get caught. But we know the other side is true as well, that bad things sometimes do happen to good people. The question though is, disciples, and maybe us, want to assign blame. Who sinned? Jesus' response to the disciples indicates that they are asking the wrong question. The question isn't who sinned, who's to blame. He's got a new question for us. The question is, how is God going to be glorified in the middle of this unfortunate situation? Or perhaps put another way, how is this an opportunity for love to be shown here? Do you see the difference, the contrast? The disciples' question is not based in compassion for the man, the human being. It's based on a desire to judge. That's what blame is. It's either his fault or his parents' fault. It's got to be somebody's fault. And Jesus said, what's going on here is not about blame. It's about God's glory. If you want to blame anyone, Jesus might say, well, blame God. But it's not finally about blame. It's not finally about why. It's about what now. Helen Keller, we might remember her, who, although she wasn't born blind, lost her ability to see and hear by the time she was two years old. An illness robbed her of her sight. And she never regained her sight or her hearing. And yet through the help of the remarkable teacher Anne Sullivan and others, Helen learned how to communicate extraordinarily well. And through her words and her presence, she became an inspiration to millions and millions of people. She knew the truth of the words she spoke. And she said this, the only thing worse than being blind is having sight but no vision. The disciples could see perfectly well. They just didn't have vision. Neither apparently did many of the other characters in today's gospel. The neighbors and those who had seen the man before as a beggar, for instance, they couldn't believe their eyes. That sort of transformation didn't compute for them. Then there's the Pharisees. The newly sighted man tells them what Jesus has done and then starts a debate among them about Jesus. Now notice, the question they ask is not, how is this an opportunity for love going to be shown here? It's instead, how can a sinner who would dare to heal somebody on the Sabbath perform such signs? These guardians of righteousness are still locked in, the, in on old questions. Who sinned? Who's to blame? How do we keep the letter of the law? In healing the man born blind, Jesus deconstructs their theological worldview. And much the same when our theology, when our thinking about God and life comes into conflict with our experience of God and life, something has to give. Either we deny our experience or maybe we can adjust our theology a little bit. Either we begin to see the world anew in the light of God's compassion and grace, which recognizes people as children of God, and looks beyond blame to ask a question. How can God's glory be revealed? How can love be shown here and now while we've still got time to show it? Well, the Gospel gives us an answer to such questions. Note that the blind man follows Jesus' direction to go to wash in the pool of Siloam which John the Evangelist, incidentally, wants us to know means sent, the one who is sent. Apostello in Greek, the same word from which we get the word apostle, or one who is sent out. 
Remember that we, brothers and sisters, have been washed by the waters of baptism. And like the man born blind, our baptism commissions us, sends us out to proclaim the good news. So be attentive this week to the opportunities where you can demonstrate God's love for others. But more than that, let's pray to see our world with the eyes of Jesus, with new eyes. In his vision, everything, even the greatest tragedy, can become an occasion in which God's work can be revealed. Christos was God's.